I'm Robert Lombardo, and uh, for quite a number of years, I had the honor, and I would say privilege and blessing, of uh, being the uh, agent for uh, Renata Scotto. Uh, from uh, the early 1970s, when she returned to the Met uh, in Vespri Siciliani, I had uh, first heard Renata when I was a student in Italy studying on a junior year abroad uh, in Florence. And I was determined to get to La Scala. And uh, I managed to get to La Scala uh, in the spring of 1962, where I got to hear Li Ugonotti with a fantastic cast, including Franco Corelli and Joan Sutherland and um, Giulietta Simeonato, among others, and Nikolai Gyalrov. And I got to hear Medea with Maria Callas and John Vickers. And I got to hear a wonderful performance of Rigoletto with uh, Gianni Raimondi as the Duke and uh, Ettore Bastianini as Rigoletto and a soprano by the name of Renata Scotto as Gilda. And I can only say that after hearing that performance of Rigoletto, I really didn't need a train to take me back to Florence to finish my studies. I think I, I flew there on my own power because I was on such a high, I just really couldn't believe it. But it was a golden period of opera and I was very privileged to be a part of it. When the performance of Rigoletto finished, uh, I waited in the Via Filodramatici to see the singers because I was also interested to see uh, Ettore Bastianini and uh, Gianni Raimondi. Bastianini I'd heard in New York uh, and uh, Raimondi I had followed on recordings, but Renata Scotto was kind of new to me. And um, uh, anyway, I, I waited for them. I got their autographs and I spoke to Renata and told her that I was from New York and I was studying in Florence. And she said to me in Italian, ma forse ver vengo a New York, uh, non adesso, ma nel prossimo futuro. And I would imagine that she'd already had outreach from the Met. She'd already made her American debut, I, I didn't know at the time, as Mimi in Bohème with Lyric Opera of Chicago. Uh, and here it was uh, three years later and I was hearing her and eventually she did come to New York. I was in law school at the time and I was unable to get to her actual debut. I had to wait to the weekend because my law classes often went into the evening and I couldn't get to the Met to get standing room in time. But I did go to the third performance and I can only tell you that the experience of hearing Scotto sing that moment on that stage, that role, was something that I had never experienced before. The way the voice just touched me and commanded my attention, every nuance in the role made me rediscover this opera, which I had known, I heard that, didn't, hadn't heard it as many times as I've now heard it at my age and my experience, but I certainly knew it and I had been to other Met performances of Butterfly previously, but this was something extraordinary. This was a completely different approach and a wonderful voice, but above all, a very, very, very human communication on a level that was so telling and so touching that by the time the performance finished, uh, I don't think I had energy, any energy left. And I was surprised that I was still standing in my standing spot down in what they used to call the Milanoff corner on in house right uh, at the old Met. I wanted to be there because I wanted to see her as well as hear her. Anyway, I waited again outside. I didn't even think about waiting outside on the men's side to see Johnny Raimondi, who happened to be the tenor that night. But I was fully and overwhelmingly in love with Renata Scotto. And uh, from that point on, I went to as many of her performances as I could, as I could get to. And I became part of a small group, which included a, a, a budding journalist by the name of Jeffrey Leipzig, 
and a budding conductor by the name of Joseph de Ruggeris, who later became associated with Giancarlo Menotti uh, at uh, Spoleto in, in Italy. And we would go to these performances. We would commiserate before, during, and then after we would wait to see Renata. And slowly we were brought into a circle, I think, of, yes, adoring friend, friends and uh, friendship because I, I was brought into this circle. Uh, I don't know how, I really don't know why, but I was there and um, we did become friends, uh, became friends with Renata and Lorenzo. I got a chance to meet Renata's American relatives, uh, her cousin Olga and her uncle Frank uh, from Westchester. And uh, we became a group, we became, I would say family. Uh, subsequent to that, um, my, my appearances at the opera were a little bit less because uh, Uncle Sam called me and uh, I was uh, in the New Jersey National Guard for my service period. But the minute that I got out, my first trip was to get to Italy to hear Renata sing I Lombardi alla Prima Crociata at Rome Opera. And then uh, the, 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 um, La Straniera in Palermo uh, in the very beginning of um, 1967, I think it was. So these years were very, very exciting. I, um, at the time, Renata had a press person by the name of Nini Castiglioni and I became friends with Nini and uh, Nini brought me under her wing and uh, many, many times uh, we traveled together and um, it just so happened that um, in uh, 1975, the fall of 1975, I was in New York helping Nini. She had some things to, to do with her artists, mostly were uh, artists from London Records. So we, we were working with Tivaldi and uh, uh, Del Monaco, and um, at that time, I think also Simeonato and Siepi. And um, Renata came to New York. She was on her way to San Francisco to uh, make her debut there. And um, Renata was in New York for about a week and we socialized and saw each other. She came and she stayed with me uh, in my apartment on 60th Street. and. She made sure that she cooked a wonderful risotto and uh, we just had a lovely time spending it together. Um, Renato was about ready to leave for San Francisco and uh, Lorenzo, her husband, was delayed in Italy and um, Renata asked me if I would come with her to San Francisco. She didn't want to travel alone and at the time she did not speak English very well. Her English was not at all fluent. So I went with her to San Francisco. We got settled in, everything was fine. And she had a major success as Butterfly with Jose Carreras. It was a wonderful series of performances. While I was in San Francisco, uh, the phone rang and it was Charlie Rica from the Met asking uh, about Renata's availability. And that of course, developed into the famous performances of Elena in Vespri Siciliani. And so uh, uh, at that time, Renata was represented by the, the Sal Hurok uh, organization. And um, first, of course, I had to double check that she was available for the performances. So Renata and I called Lorenzo in Italy and we double checked the calendar. And then uh, I got back to Charlie and told him that she's available and would be very happy to come and sing those performances. And I guess you could say after that, the rest was history because I accompanied Renata when she came to New York. I accompanied her to her first rehearsal with James Levine. Of course, uh, I believe Placido was there, Ruggiero Raimondi. Uh, no, excuse me, Placido was, was, was the, uh, the tenor, um, it wasn't Ruggiero Raimondi, I believe it was Justino Diaz was the Procida. 
anyway, with Renata and and uh, Jimmy, it was love at first sight. And um, when the rehearsal rehearsal was over, Jimmy was just beaming uh, unimaginably. He was just amazing. It was just amazing. And uh, so then we we kind of solidified what I would call an assistant ship agency. And uh, uh, Lorenzo finally came to New York when, when the Vespries went up. So we were able to talk about how they wanted to work with me, what they wanted me to do. And um, it just continued from there and it continued right through uh, most of the remainder of Renata's career. Um, and it was, it was the most exciting time of my life, of course, how could it not be, but also all of the other things that, um, that happened during that time, there were, um, the, the, the production of Le Prophète, for example, um, Renata was engaged to sing the role of Berta. It was, um, a vehicle actually being, being staged for Marilyn Horn, who I had worked for briefly as, um, as a, um, a kind of business manager, Foctotum, when she and Henry Lewis first moved to New Jersey. But um, uh, the, the performances and the production of Le Prophète were a wonderful vehicle for Renata as well, because the stage director was John Dexter and uh, Renata and John Dexter got along very, very well. And um, the Met career burgeoned after that. Um, so many things that I remember that happened and so many wonderful performances. Um, and of course, she sang a number of recitals around the US. At that time, she was commuting back and forth from Italy. And uh, she did have two children at the time. She had both uh, Laura, her daughter, and Filippo, her son who were quite young and uh, Laura uh, needed to actually start school. And so it was decided that uh, they would move to New York and they bought a beautiful apartment uh, on the Upper East Side and uh, Laura was registered in school and then later Filippo was registered in school. And then as Renata's career expanded and became lengthier in the United States, they were here most of the time. And they moved uh, to Westchester County. Uh, they moved um, to a number, of, a number of places in beautiful Westchester, finishing finally in Armonk uh, in upper Westchester County. Um, Renata, I was always, taken by her, uh, I used to call her the mistress of little things. The way she studied and the way she worked a role. Um, I'm sure most other great artists come from a similar point of view, but her thought process was very interesting. And this is just from my observation. I felt that she obviously used text in whatever language she was singing in. Most of the operas she did were in Italian, but she also had uh, roles in, in French and then later in German and even in English. Uh, I was very observant of her, uh, her detail. Her, 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 her details were as important as the big moments. So if you listen to anything she does, you listen to any aria that she sings, especially what I call storytelling arias, you know, that are most evident in, in Puccini uh, and in some of the other Verismo works that she sang. The telling of the story of the character was so important because on the moment, they're expressing a reality and that reality has to be told through the voice, through the color of the sound, with the music, faithfully observing the indications of the conductor. And she was religiously attached to following the conductor's indications. And um, 
that's why she always felt that um, being a soprano meant that you were a soprano and you should be able to sing everything that's written for soprano. Now, it might not, every role might not be absolutely right for you, but you have the idea that the, uh, the role is um, written for the soprano tessitura, so you really shouldn't have a difficulty in executing it. And uh, this was particularly applicable, uh, I think, in Verdi, because, um, yes, she recorded the role of Abagaile in Nabucco. She recorded it with Ricardo, with Ricardo Muti for EMI, and it was a huge success, but she never thought of doing that role on stage because she knew that it wasn't right for her voice in the theater on a stage. Because there you have to think about a lot of other things other than the singing and the expression of the character. But everything that she did from Musetta in Bohème, the way she analyzed that role from top to bottom, and the way she reflected the role from her many mimis that she'd done so successfully, the way she, re she reflected Mimi in her Musetta was quite incredible. And um, just, just these, these things used to bring me to almost to my knees sometimes when, when I would go to performances and I would hear these things. Uh, I can think in, in, in her Elisabetta in Don Carlos, so many moments, so many touches in the Non Piangere Mia Compagna how that kind of regret and, and, and um, sadness, melancholy, would come into the color, the sound, not just into Verdi's vocal line, but it was there, the true acting with the voice, expression of the character. And of, I think also in the duet with Carlo in the last act, and noi lascerem nel grembo del Signore, the, though that phrase, uh, noi ci troverem nel grembo del Signore, that phrase always read to me in every performance because it meant so much that there in the embrace of, in God's embrace, we will find each other again. And these kinds of things aren't just notes. They were never treated as notes. They were treated as an expression of what the, um, composer intended, which to, to underline the fact that she never, in, never became involved in a production that she wasn't convinced in the regie. I remember we were talking a bit, uh, she was in Bonn and she was doing a production by Georges Lavelli of Norma. Now this production was at the beginning of the Regie Theater craze, where all of a sudden Norma was a, a revolutionary. And Norma actually, the, the, the idea of Norma was in the form of La Passionada, the famous uh, uh, Spanish Revolution uh, woman, uh, her character. And when Renata understood that this is what Lavelli intended, she decided to take on the whole thing. She decided to take the character as La Passionara, because I remember that um, the entrance of Norma in Casta Diva was on the top of a Jeep holding a machine gun dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt and uh, very unglamorous from uh, many of the Normas that I heard Renata do, the one in Vienna where she wore this immense um, uh, feathered overrobe over a beautiful white pleated gown, um, and the and the the, uh, the other Norma Normas that she did around the world in in at the Florence Festival with Muti and um, uh, in other theaters as well. But uh, she decided to take on the whole thing when she did this role and actually made it work. She made it work so that you were convinced 
that this was Norma. And uh, I was in Bonn, this was in Bonn, and I was there for three performances. And one after another, they were quite, quite extraordinary, and so was the reception. Then I also remember the first run of Louisa Miller's at the, at, at the Met and the incredible success of this, of this role, of this characterization of who Louisa is right from the first scene and the first aria and then how it progressed through the piece right through the last act, which to this day, when I look at it on the DVD, I wonder just how it all came to pass. The, the, the miracle of not only Scotto's singing and interpretation, but Domingo in fabulous shape, Cheryl Milnes as uh, Louisa's father, and Bernardo Giotti uh, as the Count, with Jimmy Levine conducting. It was something that always puts me in a, in a very, very special place, this very, very exciting um performance and all of the whole performance is exciting but when you come to that last act to me that's one of the great miracles of verdi and it rivals the last act of many of his operas including forza and trovatore and Brioletto. um and renata in in her later years decided to take on some some repertoire that was not natural to her, but she found it challenging and interesting. And she was offered to do her first Kundri, uh, which learning an opera in a language that she had very little speaking ability in was a challenge. But she did it and she did it with huge success. And uh, while she didn't keep the role in the repertoire, she did it. And I, I remember I was there in Germany when she did the when she did the performances and uh, they were quite riveting, I must say. And of course, she took on, uh, she took on Richard Strauss's Marshallin, which I heard her sing several times. And um, when we were in, when she was in Europe singing this, I remember specifically uh, people saying that it was comparable to Maria Cebotari, who was a famous Marshallin from Strauss's time. So I think it was a very important compliment. But I do remember particularly the monologue in act one and how delicately she handled it and how she infused it with her unique voice and color and personality. And also in the last act, in the trio, and then when she and Faninal make their final pass on stage Ya yeah, Ya yeah, was said with such, I don't want to say regret, again, a kind of sadness, but not a sadness that ended anything. It was kind of like, yes, I'm leaving this and now I go on to something else. It was very lovely. And I managed to hear, I think, maybe six different performances of Marshall and and then in one concert, I remember very specifically, she sang uh, Schoenberg's Erwartung. And it was the first time that I ever heard that particular piece sung where I was driven to listen to the melody because her voice found the melody in that piece. It was quite extraordinary. Then, of course, Renata had uh, great interest in, um, in staging and in costume design. And uh, over the years, she got involved in a number of productions that she staged, a number of new productions that she worked on. There was a wonderful opportunity that took place with Florida Grand Opera years ago, where Renata was invited to stage. Uh, she had already staged Tosca for them. But uh, they were doing a new production of uh, La Sonambula. Uh, by this time, uh, Renata was pretty much retired from singing. And um, she conceived this production of Sonambula, which I remember being there for the opening night. And it was such a huge success. 
And Robert Hewer, who was the gen general manager of Florida Grand Opera at that time, had the idea to bring Renata to, to stage and to help design the production and bring Richard Bonning in to conduct it. So these two different approaches to bel canto were not exclusion they were not uh, one didn't exclude the other they actually worked together beautifully i remember a number of occasions uh, two occasions in particular when renata was singing the tritico and when she was singing adriana le couvreur that um, maestro bonning and uh, dame joan came to those performances and always came back to see Renata uh, and talk with her. And um, at a later point, I was working myself uh, with a, a, a group of master classes in Italy and Maestro Bonning was an invited guest. And um, we, we had a chance to speak about some of these uh, wonderful things from the past. And uh, he remembered very specifically how Joan wanted very much to see and understand what Renata did in the Tritico and in the Adriana Le Couvre, how she approached it. And it was very interesting and the kind of artistic give and take that, uh, that, they, that they had uh, was, was also interesting. I do recall when Renata was doing a series of butterflies at the Met, I believe it was in the 77 season, cast was quite marvelous. It was Renata, and uh, Giacomo Aragal was the uh, Pinkerton, and Leonucci was Sharpless, and Giuseppe Patane was the conductor. Those, those performances were to me extraordinary, and it's a shame that they were not part of the live from the Met series, because I think those were the greatest performances of Butterfly that Renata sang at the Met. In any event, um, there was a radio broadcast with that cast and uh, Renata was getting out of her wig and uh, the dressing room phone rang and I picked it up and uh, the other end, I heard this voice exclaim, Renata, Renata. And I said, uh, I said, uh, this is, I said, Renata's having, is, is with her uh, dresser. <coughs> It was Leontine Price calling and Leontine Price said, I have to speak with Renata. I have to speak with her. And uh, I gave the phone to Renata and they were on the phone for about 10 minutes or so. And I could see from Renata talking with her, they spoke mostly in Italian. Uh, and I could just see the expression on Renata's face of what she and Leontine Price were talking about, but I do know that uh, it was quite expressive. A, a great artist like Price calling a colleague and telling her exactly how she, how she felt the result of that broadcast was. Not everyone is so magnanimous in the opera world, but that was something quite extraordinary, of course. Leontine Price is extraordinary. And uh, um, some of these other vignettes, I was going back in my memory thinking, you know, Renata did Musetta in the Zeffirelli production of Bohème, but we seem to forget that her very first Musetta was a Met Opera Guild special with Danny Kaye, uh, where essentially her musetta was the waltz and the concertato. I think that was more or less it, which is the second act. They were staging it for a special enclosed video that they were doing for the Met Guild for the educational purposes of the Guild. And uh, so Renata sang her first musetta only act two. And later that season, uh, Jimmy came to her and said, why don't you do a full musetta with us this year? And um, actually, she said she would do them. 
and she did about six or seven performances that year. This was in the production, the same production in which she and Luciano sang the very first Live from the Met, uh, Bohème. Now that night, when Renata finished Act Two of Bohème, the house fell in. It was such an immense success. And uh, I believe the cast included uh, Placido and Jimmy was the conductor, I believe. And the debuting soprano that evening was Ileana Cotrubas. And um, I remember uh, Cotrubas being a little bit reticent. She was being a little bit shy, possibly, I could say, to a certain extent, annoyed, you know, that this Renata Scotto, you know, comes out on her debut night at the Met and, you know, has this huge success. It was the first time the public got to hear Renata sing the full Musetta. Anyway, at the end of the opera, when the calls came out, uh, there was a unit call and uh, all of the singers came out and I very, I was standing on uh, I was standing on stage left and I could see the calls. And um, so they were all holding hands and they walked forward. And um, at a certain point, while the, 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 the pitch of the audience was incredible, Renata and Placido moved back and Renata pushed uh, Cotrubas forward and they all left, all the cast left letting Cotrubas have her big solo ovation. Later, later, much later, I was judging a competition in St. Petersburg and Ileana Cotrubas was on, the, was on the panel with me. And we would talk every day. And uh, she, I remember her turning to me once and saying, uh, I remember when La Tua Scotto uh, almost stole my debut success from me. And she said, but I will never forget what she and Placido did at the end of that performance. I said, yes, I remember that. Again, you say artists are pretty much selfish and jealous but I didn't see that. I saw only magnanimity. I, I can only say that um, my respect for her, my empathy for her as well, because Renata was someone who was quite torn uh, about her uh, uh, obligations to her colleagues and her obligations on stage and preparedness and um, uh, and also as a wife and mother, and um, it was it was a it was difficult for her. She did everything that she could, and uh, in the long run, I think things turned out quite well. She has two wonderful children and two wonderful grandchildren, and. Uh, I think a very, a very successful life on many, many ways. Recently, I was uh, on a, a trip, a personal trip, and uh, I remembered every night that I was in dressing room with Renata, there was a small image, plastic image of Notre Dame de Lourdes that she carried with her. And that little plastic statue would be out on her dressing table. So when I was in Lourdes earlier this year, uh, I went uh, to the shrine and uh, I made sure that there was a candle among the other, among the candles that I, I lit, I made sure that there was a nice big one for Renata, uh, illuminating her in heaven, that's where I see her. Early February, uh, Renata's native town, 
uh, in Italy, Savona, uh, honored her with a celebration of life, which was pretty much organized by uh, uh, Renata's daughter, Laura. And um, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful evening at the Criberia Theater, which was the place where Renata made her debut as Violetta in Traviata when she was 18 years old. And um, it's a place where she has given master classes and, and the last few years staged opera for the Giacosa group, which is the opera group in, uh, in Savona. And um, it was a beautiful tribute to her. And it was something that I think Renata would have really appreciated. The town of Savona was filled with wonderful photographs of uh, Renata's image all over the place, particularly in the main square, uh, which now in front of the theater, that square will be named for Renata and uh, also the main piazza in front of the cathedral. There were wonderful signs and manifests all, all over the place with Renata's face and uh, a beautiful tribute for her, the kind of tribute that I know she would have appreciated. She was never anyone who wanted over the top anything. She just wanted things dimensioned right, that it all should be it all should be right. It all should be in its right place. That's why she was so faithful to the composers that she sang. And uh, again, I want to say that the life that I spent over those years working as her agent and as her friend were the most rewarding and blessed periods of my life. I could not have asked for anything more and I consider myself one of the most fortunate people that have lived in this period. God bless you, Renata. Speaking Opera focuses on documenting the career activities of currently active singers, composers, musicians, and authors in the field of operatic performance and scholarship, and specialists in the field of audio recording, as well as those who have retired fully or partially from performing and or teaching. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use.